Good evening, I'm Andrew Chang. And I'm Adrian Arsenault. Tonight, the biggest crisis facing the monarchy in decades. The fallout from Meghan and Harry's explosive interview. I just didn't want to be alive anymore. They say Meghan's plea for help was ignored while she and unborn Archie were subject to racism from the British tabloids and the royal family. Concerns and conversations about how dark his skin might be when he's born. What? The interview everyone is talking about except the palace. Tonight, the meaning of this moment for women of color around the world. Also tonight, we reveal a communication breakdown. We are trying to do the best that we can with the data that we have. How a critical decision about who can get the AstraZeneca vaccine was misunderstood and where it leaves seniors waiting for the shot. Plus, a glimpse at normal. The U.S. lays out the do's and don'ts for the fully vaccinated. This is The National. Part of the power of Buckingham Palace rests with its image of tradition and service to the Commonwealth. That's why Oprah Winfrey's blockbuster interview with Prince Harry and Meghan, the Duchess of Sussex, is so explosive. And tonight, that interview aired in the UK. And for some, it will be a final blow to the idea that the British royal family can move out of its past. They were willing to lie. What I was seeing was history repeating itself. I just didn't, I just didn't want to be alive anymore. So even as she thought of harming herself, she said the royal family blocked her from getting help while leaving her exposed to tabloid attacks. Ever since Harry and Meghan announced their exit from royal life, Buckingham Palace has painted it as a choice they made. But according to them, staying was not an option. And Renee Filipponi brings us the reaction to the most explosive allegation of all, that the Duchess of Sussex was experiencing racism, not just from the press, but from the royal family itself. It was a fairy tale moment, and with it came the promise of a new chapter for the British monarchy. Now, not even three a years later, it's wedding, ended in a tell all interview and allegations of racism towards their and young really son, Archie. Feelings. And also concerns and conversations about how dark his skin might be when he's born. What? Today, hurts. Oprah Winfrey said um, Harry later I made it I clear am, this wasn't coming from the Queen. That it was not his grandmother mother, nor his grandfather that were a part of those conversations. But it's that quote that captured headlines and the attention of the British people. I'm happy that she spoke out about it. I feel like people need to know. I think that they get, a lo uh, they get away with a lot of things, so I'm happy that she said something. Megan says the treatment she received had her thinking of suicide. But some well-known critics of the couple paint the interview as self-serving and one-sided. They basically make out the entire royal family a bunch of white supremacists by dropping this race bombshell without... that phrase? It's been horrific to watch some of what I've seen this morning. This marketing consultant says racism has always been a factor in the way Meghan has been covered by the press, but says now attention is directed at the palace and it must take action. I think these things need to be investigated as a matter of urgency in the same way that they were happy to um, report last week that they would be investigating within the royal household about these claims of bullying against Meghan. And for some in Parliament, the issues raised during the interview go far beyond the walls of the palace. It's bigger in a sense than just the royal family because, you know, that experience of racism, I'm sad to say, is too prevalent still in 21st century Britain. We all have to take that seriously. For his part, the Prime Minister would only say he has the highest admiration for the Queen. Uh, I've spent a long time uh, now not uh, commenting on uh, royal family matters, and I don't intend uh, to depart from that today. All right, so, Renee, what's, what's the palace saying? Well, it's been 24 hours since the interview first aired and still silence from the palace. But if and when they do respond, people will be looking at that statement very closely to see it if it addresses the allegations such as racism and whether an investigation is ordered. But Adrian, the royal drama isn't over. Tomorrow, the Duchess of Sussex's estranged father, Thomas Markle, will be a guest on Good Morning Britain and interviewed by none other than Harry and Meghan's fiercest critic, Piers Morgan. All right, Renee Filipponi outside Buckingham Palace tonight. Thank you, Renee.
Now, the departure of Harry and Meghan from the firm has been playing out in the press for a while now. But this interview represents a remarkably public rupture. And Thomas Daigle explains why it is the most dramatic crisis Buckingham Palace has faced in decades. What a difference a year can make. This Commonwealth Day service would turn out to be Prince Harry and Meghan's last public engagement as working royals. When we gathered here, A year later, Westminster, Westminster Abbey, nearly empty due to COVID, and the royal family facing a threat of the existential kind. I am reminded once again that the essence of the Commonwealth is its remarkable diversity. It's clearer than ever the monarchy's past stands in stark contrast with the present. Remember, many of those Commonwealth nations were once controlled by Britain, and it's hard to separate the monarchy from that colonial history. These are archaic institutions uh, that are dripping in systemic racism and uh, gender uh, discrimination. Call it a moment of reckoning, but not the first one, since this interview... That they were willing to lie to protect other members of the family. Reminded many of that them. one. Well, the enemy was my husband's department. Diana's explosive BBC tell-all in 95, then the royal family's inaction immediately following her death may be the only comparable crises in recent memory. Combined with Prince Andrew's fall from grace, British Republicans sense an opportunity. And the monarchy does not represent British values. I mean, I think people are absolutely appalled. It does damage particularly to Charles, William and others. We're going to be anyone's left on the stage when uh, the Queen dies. Commonwealth nation Barbados already had plans to drop Queen Elizabeth as its head of state later this year. And in Canada, there's been declining support too, says this pollster, but... The bar to make a change around the monarchy is so high that I think it will be generations before uh, anyone's ready to go there. Amid 1,200 years of history, this may yet prove as important a chapter as any. Thomas Dagle, CBC News, Toronto. And we will have more on the impact of Harry and Meghan's interview. It certainly is a trigger to experiences that I've had and black women have had everywhere. How Megan's interview shatters the promise of a royal family open to change. And from those who know both the palace and the people the royal family serve, a conversation about what has to happen next. That's in about 20 minutes. Turning to the pandemic now, COVID restrictions eased for millions of Canadians today. Measures lifted partially in New Brunswick, Alberta and Quebec. And in one of the country's hotspots, people did something today they haven't done in a very long time. They went to the mall. It's exciting to get back to something that's, you know, close to what we used to do. So, yeah, it's nice. So customers lined up early outside Toronto's Eaton Centre with stay-at-home orders lifting in three Ontario regions. Canada is expected to receive more than 900,000 doses of vaccine this week. And with that steady supply, provinces are ramping up their rollouts. Canadians across the country are finally booking appointments to get the shot. But how and how fast you get it depends on where you live. Susanna De Silva begins in BC tonight, walking us through the anticipation, the relief, and in some cases, the frustration. Today turned out much better than bothering Orion and his 94-year-old grandmother expected. I can't talk about it. <laughs> She's old, she can't talk a lot of English, but she's very excited. When BC announced those 90 and over and Indigenous elders over 65 could book their shots, appointments were supposed to begin next week, but some locations were already up and running today. I just made sure to go in right away at 7 a.m. and I was lucky, I guess, and I was able to find an appointment with her for her today and it took about five minutes. But their health authority is the only one in the province offering an online booking option. We are currently experiencing a high call volume and are not able to take your call at this time. Julie Matta spent six hours calling before getting her 95-year-old father an appointment for next week. This is so important and everybody else, I can understand that they're just as anxious as I am to get their, uh, their elderly loved ones vaccinated. 55,000 people fell into the age group eligible to register today. 1.7 million people called in the first three hours. We have to do better in responding as well. And we will need to because the demand isn't going to get less. It's going to grow. It's exciting. And that demand is growing across the country. Oh, I'm delighted. Couldn't wait for it. 
One of several mobile vaccine clinics happening today in Toronto made a visit to this senior's residence. It's an amazing thing. It's almost like winning the lottery. It means that there, there's a window or there's a light at the end of the tunnel. The city will be opening three mass vaccination clinics next week as long as expected doses arrive. And in Alberta, the province will start vaccinating those 50 and older on Wednesday with the newly arrived AstraZeneca vaccine. And while many still have questions and concerns about when it will be their turn. No, not but undertake. Yeah, she's very happy and no pain. Those who have gone through are grateful. Susanna De Silva, CBC News, Vancouver. And so with more Canadians getting the shot, next the question, when will this all end? Well, today we're getting a glimpse of what life after vaccination could look like coming from new guidance south of the border. Katie Simpson brings us the details and what it might mean for Canada. More shots are going into arms across the U.S. faster than ever before. Close to 10% of the population is now fully vaccinated. It's enough for the country's top public health leaders to loosen recommended restrictions. Today, I think we've, we've begun to describe what a world looks like where we move beyond COVID-19. The new guidelines say fully vaccinated people can visit other fully vaccinated people for small indoor gatherings in private settings like a home. No masks, no physical distancing required. I'm most looking forward to seeing family that I haven't really been able to see. Fully vaccinated people can also visit with unvaccinated people from one household, as long as no members of that household are at high risk for serious illness. No masks, no physical distancing required either. Here's an example. If grandparents have been vaccinated, they can visit their daughter and her family, even if they have not been vaccinated, so long as the daughter and her family are not at risk for severe disease. I'm looking forward to visiting my grandkids. Now we can play games and run around in the backyard. Large gatherings are still discouraged and fully vaccinated people are being urged to keep wearing a mask in public and practice physical distancing. But in Canada, there is no specific guidance yet and it's unclear if and when recommendations will be adjusted. The Public Health Agency of Canada says there is still limited evidence on whether someone who received a COVID-19 vaccine is still able to transmit the virus. U.S. officials warned the guidance could change depending on what the science says. On average, there are still 57,000 new COVID cases a day here. And while that's dramatically lower than January's peak, experts warn of another possible surge if people aren't careful. Katie Simpson, CBC News, Washington. Well, the AstraZeneca vaccine has been wrapped up in a global debate over a simple question. Is it or isn't it effective in seniors? In Canada, the current recommendation is against giving it to anyone over 65. We dug into that decision and learned that it's led to confusion from Canadians and health experts alike at a pretty critical time. AstraZeneca's authorization in Canada was a clear win. This is very encouraging news. But just days after Health Canada gave its seal of approval, signaling it was safe and effective in all age groups, Canada's National Advisory Committee on Immunization was preparing to publish a surprising recommendation. NACI does not recommend the use of this vaccine in individuals 65 years of age and older. We are trying to do the best that we can with the data that we have. But dig a little deeper into Appendix C near the bottom of the report and you'll find a summary of the data that drove their decision. Unless otherwise noted, all data presented in this summary is based on a data cutoff date of December 7th, 2020. That means they focused primarily on clinical trial data from last year. But what was happening in the world between December and March? AstraZeneca Impfstoff tatsächlich die Quote von Hospitalisierung um 94 Prozent reduziert, ja. Millions of AstraZeneca vaccines were going into the arms of seniors and it appeared to work very well. You have phase two data suggesting it's fine. You have a, a cousin vaccine in Johnson & Johnson suggesting it's fine, which is a similar mechanism. So what did NACI know and when? The only real world evidence that we had was a Scottish paper, which to us was a problem in terms of scientific validity. But also there are real limitations to what data they can take into account just before publication. 
we are not a committee that is able to make a recommendation on Monday to be published on the Tuesday. It's not how the system functions because of as all I said, we need to translate, there needs to be web coding, and that takes at least a few days. In the meantime, at no point was it clear to the Canadian public to what extent NASI had considered real world data or whether it was thinking about changing its mind. How quickly is data changing? How important is it to be up to speed? The evidence is changing day by day. I think resourcing an organization like that to have the ability to actually um, uh, respond to real life data, put out statements, change guidance, be able to convey that appropriately, communicate at, at a level which I think the Canadian population needs, you know, it, it's so important. So, Andrew, I mean, obviously a lot of confusion over the last week, but interesting to hear Dr. Chagla mention resourcing there. Right. Is money the problem? Well, so, so let's be clear here. These are all top experts in their fields who right. serve in this committee, but they're all volunteering in their roles on those committees. This is not some elaborate organization that has comms teams and, and PR people, but clearly there's a problem that needs solving here. Because if NASI decides to reverse its decision about the AstraZeneca vaccine and who can get it, and it might do that in the coming weeks. How do you unplant the seed that's been sown in the minds of people that maybe this doesn't work as well in seniors? That could be a, be a real problem. It will, for sure. Well, tomorrow night, uh, we are planning a special two-hour event to answer your questions. We know you have a lot of them about the vaccine. The COVID vaccine is our shot to save lives, our shot to put this pandemic behind us. So when will you be able to get it? What do we know about the science behind the vaccines? What could our future really look like? We're taking your questions live and putting them to the experts in Our Shot, a national town hall. It all starts tomorrow night at 8 p.m. on CBC News Network and CBC Gem, and there will be a special edition of The National at 10 p.m. local on CBC Television. We Charities Kielberger Brothers have finally agreed to testify before the Commons Ethics Committee. There's a fundamental unfairness to having uh, allegations which are already before law enforcement authorities um, also considered uh, in a duplicative process before members of parliament. The Gilbergers were scheduled to appear today but had declined. That's when members unanimously issued a summons to make them appear. The committee is investigating last summer's WE scandal and how the charity became part of the federal government's plans for a student grant program. And former Liberal MP Yasmin Ratansi has been ordered to pay back more than $9,000 to the House of Commons. Members of Parliament say she breached the rules by employing her sister in her constituency office on taxpayer dollars for years. Several former employees told CBC News last fall the MP tried to cover up for her sister with fake names, even hiding her under a desk when people who would recognize her stopped by. Ratansi currently sits as an independent. Well, the trial of the white police officer who kneeled on George Floyd's neck was supposed to start today, but it's been delayed over the possibility of an additional murder charge. Susan Ormiston is in Minneapolis tonight, a city hoping the painful trial will get underway soon. No Chants and demands from protesters around the Minneapolis courthouse 10 months since George Floyd was killed. I'm here because, honestly, it's time. It's time for everyone to be here. This is the right side of history to be on. The court and city hall fortified by a security ring of cement and steel protected by Minnesota's National Guard called up specifically for the trial. The matter before the court is the state of Minnesota versus Derek Chauvin. Fired police officer Derek Chauvin, who pressed his knee into Floyd's neck, sat taking notes. Charged with second degree murder and manslaughter, the courtroom reconfigured for COVID precautions with plastic shields, few participants, and live streamed. This is a huge case um, in the struggle for justice for, uh, for victims of police misconduct. For now, the trial is on pause. Prospective jurors sent home as the court deliberated adding a third degree murder charge against Derek Chauvin. The jury could be called up again tomorrow. For Tim Gill, the trial is about cop. police examining unbridled bias. I'm not going to say it's one bad cop. It is a bad system full of bad decisions by cops. The video of Chauvin pressing on Floyd for him undeniable. That's the proof. And he should go to jail for what he did, which was murder. At George Floyd Square, where he died, 
people will gather. I think this trial will, it's gonna reopen a lot of wounds. It's like pulling a Band-Aid off as we're trying to heal. P.J. Hill runs a volunteer ministry here on weekends. He grew up nearby. What we witnessed was a slow, nine-minute, gruesome murder of a man. Something inside of all of us broke. The city is holding its breath. Susan Ormiston, CBC News, Minneapolis. Susan will be back a little later with someone who knows this case well, a lawyer representing the Floyd family. And if there isn't a conviction? Then it would be one of the worst miscarriages of justice in the history of America. Ahead on the national, why he's convinced that won't happen here. Megan's painful story hits home for so many. It certainly is a trigger to experiences that I've had and black women have had everywhere. Plus, where does this leave the future kings and queens? And you might want to start making those summer plans. The great demand for the great outdoors. We're back in two. Well, around the world today, streets were full of protesters marking International Women's Day, calling for equality and an end to violence against women. And this year, the issue could not be more pertinent. The United Nations warns that the pandemic is eroding gender equality in rich and poor countries alike. That includes here in Canada, where women are bearing the brunt of COVID's economic impacts. Many of the jobs lost in this pandemic have been in fields dominated by women. And as Jacqueline Hansen reports, the effect on women's careers has the potential to last even when Canada's economy fully reopens. Carefree moments like this were few and far between for Tendai Dongo over much of the past year. As the main parent working full time from home, most of the childcare fell on her. I felt that I had to quit. I had to choose. I had to choose a full time career or my mental health. Let's go! Uncertainty has continued for parents, including Danielle Eleanor. If they get a runny nose or uh, you know a sore throat. They're basically out of school for 14 days. Eleanor had been working with a company for 10 years when the pandemic hit. I quickly realized like something had to give. She decided she would quit her job because her husband makes more money. That one in four women are talking about either stepping back or stepping out of the workplace entirely. Analysts say the pandemic threatens to leave some women behind permanently if their careers are derailed and their skills erode from being out of the workforce. The greatest risk is that if companies don't manage this challenging moment carefully and boldly with, um, with steps that help women in particular stay in the game, that we will lose a generation. One potential solution is something Jennifer Hargreaves has been advocating for for years. The institutional mindsets around flexible work have been catapulted into the future, and I'd say that's one of the silver linings of COVID. We've got 65 people here this morning. Her new online course helps women define the type of flexible job they need and find it. There is actually no better time to negotiate flexible work than right now. At BC-based corporate communications firm Banana Tag, flexibility during the pandemic has been key. About a third of its employees are parents. We allowed individuals to find what fits for them. From where they work to how many hours, it's all on the table. How can we make it even more flexible? So whether it's job sharing or having really odd hours. Eleanor is starting a new career in real estate that she hopes will be more flexible. It's a gamble that I, that I decided to make. Dongo intended to quit, but her employer offered her part-time hours instead. It's costing her some of her savings, but she says it's worth it. I still have that sense of purpose that I am still continuing in my career. A payoff she hopes will last far beyond the pandemic. Jacqueline Hansen, CBC News, Toronto. When we come back, the fallout from a bombshell interview. I just didn't want to be alive anymore. Why Megan's story hit black and racialized viewers harder. And later, the huge demand for a Canadian summer getaway. Why it's not too soon to start planning. But first. We're going to be together a long time. Canadian sitcom Kim's Convenience is coming to an end. Producers announced today that this season will be the show's last because the co-creators are leaving. Okay, see you. 
cast member Andrew Fung had a few thoughts today on the show's incredible run. This was the little show that could. This was a fringe festival show that theater companies passed on, was a hit and toured the country and became a word of mouth phenomenon. I don't even know how to tell Brody. The decision to end the show did seem to come as a surprise. Fung's co-star Simu Liu posted about the news saying he's heartbroken and was fully expecting to come back for our sixth season. He also underscored the show's importance, writing, amazing things can happen when you open the gates and allow more diverse and authentic stories to be told. You can watch the final episode of Kim's Convenience on CBC on April 13th. Okay, see you. Okay. For anyone to come forward and speak about their own struggles with mental health and tell their own personal story, that takes courage. That's certainly something the president believes. Well, that is the White House's take on Meghan and Harry's interview, a sign of how many were watching and reacting to what was said. One reason it was such a draw is that the royals are more than rich celebrities. This is an institution. And if there were those who thought Meghan's marriage to Harry was a sign that institution was changing, Magda Gabrasalasa shows us that notion is in tatters now. In the early days in front of the cameras, Meghan Markle was all smiles. Her place in the royal family was seen as a turning point for an institution steeped in white privilege. But behind closed doors... I just didn't want to be alive anymore. A shocking revelation from Markle. She says her mental health was severely damaged by isolation, lies and racism. A story that felt familiar to some watching. It certainly is a trigger to experiences that I've had and black women have had everywhere. The interview hit close to home for Rima Tavares, who is multiracial. Especially painful was this section, where Markle said a senior member of the royal family worried about her child's skin color while she was pregnant. There's a conversation with you... With Harry. ...about how dark your baby is going to be? Potentially. It reminded me very much of a conversation that I had with my own uh, grandmother on my white side, who said that when I was born, she was concerned that I would come out looking like a wood chopping N word. Even for the author Nels Abbey, who has written about race and white dominated workplaces, this came as a surprise. Should I be surprised? I probably should not be surprised because with colonialism comes racism. They, you can't separate the two of them. Friends of the couple acknowledged Markle isn't alone in her experience. Serena Williams wrote, the mental health consequences of systemic oppression and victimization are devastating, isolating, and all too often lethal. Silenced no family, more, Markle says she realized she real life said, couldn't deliver her fairy tale story, but Disney's girl, Little Mermaid like could. Oh my God. She falls in love with the prince, and because of that, she has to lose her voice. Mm. But by the end, she gets her voice back. Magda Gebrezalasa, CBC News, Toronto. So emotional, personal reactions to what Meghan and Harry shared in the interview last night. And still, no response from the royal family. So what will be the impact on the firm or the Commonwealth? Joining us, author, lawyer and women's rights activist Shola Mosa Shogbamamu and royal correspondent for the Sunday Times, Roya Nika. Thank you, both of you, uh, for joining us. And, and, and just off the top here, I know over the weekend some prominent royal commentators were exposed for speaking about this interview before having seen it. So just to be very clear for the audience, you've both seen it, yes? That's yes. correct. Okay. And so, if I may, Shola, to begin with you, I, I know that my, ground, my jaw hit the ground a, a few times. I don't know what I expected from it, but I, I was certainly surprised. Can you walk me through what stood out for you as the most jarring part of that two hours? When Meghan talked about suicidal thoughts, the fact that she had no liberty, very, very restricted liberty, I remember thinking it really odd that she had to hand in her passport. I'm thinking, why would you need to do that? I mean, why would the institution expect that from you? But of course, it got much worse, particularly when she shared the, uh, the, the conversations around the concern of the skin color of her son, Archie. Mm -hmm. And that's when I knew, oh my God, this is getting worse by the minute. We knew without a doubt, doubt that root racism is at the root 
of why Harry and Meghan felt they were not supported. They also explained how the, the palace or the institution would go on record about the most ridiculous stories, but would not lift a finger to go on record about any stories out there about them. Okay, so there's there's a lot there's a lot there. Roya, uh, anything different stand out for you? Um, well, I mean, the first thing I would say is I, I would just you know, as someone as a royal correspondent who works with the principals and the households, mm -hmm. it's not accurate to say that royal aides did not, um, you know, go out of their way to try and uh, guide and overturn stories that weren't true. They did, and I have first-hand experience of that. I think for me, the thing that really stood out was how broken Harry feels his relationship is with close members of his family. You know, his brother and his father, you know, he talked about the fact that he, he and his, his father were on non-speakers for quite a long time. And I think although, you know, he kept saying, I respect Her Majesty the Queen, and, you know, Meghan said, you know, she gave an affectionate anecdote about her. If you, if you um, lay blows on members of the royal family and the institution of which the Queen is head, you are really, you know, taking pot shots at the Queen herself. So, uh, g given your experience, Roya, I'm curious, what do you think the consequences are for the institution that is the royal family uh, of Meghan and Harry saying that, that, for example, you know, racism coursed through their lives and that at least one senior royal was concerned about Archie's skin colour? Well, I mean, you know, those are really disturbing and upsetting claims. And uh, what will be absolutely key is how Buckingham Palace respond to this. And, uh, you know, I, I think my understanding is that they will try and respond to this within the next you know, tw 24 hours or quite soon. Because whatever they say next, however they respond to it, and I think they will need to go into, you know, quite serious detail to rebut or confirm those allegations in their statement. Because otherwise, you know, there'll be a narrative that's unchecked of an institution and a family. And by not naming which member of the family they're talking about, all members of the royal family now come under suspicion as being racist. And that's very damaging. You know, as, as speaking to you from a Commonwealth country, I, I know there are lots of other Commonwealth nations that are asking questions about the institution today. Do you think, Roy, that there is a consequence for the institution in terms of its place in other Commonwealth countries? The monarchy has a huge, you know, the Queen has a huge, commands a huge amount of respect across the Commonwealth, particularly in the Commonwealth realms. So I, the monarchy has been through very choppy waters uh, very often and it will weather this storm i think i just think it's very sad i think there are important issues here that need to be explored and looked at but i feel that, that they should have been done within a family instead of within a public debate i i agree i agree with you because i would have thought that the elders in the family would have put their arms around harry and Meghan. it really isn't rocket science if she needs help give her the help she needs. If they need support, give them the support they need. It's not rocket science. But because the elders, this might not even be the queen, it might be the queen. The only reason we mention the queen is because she's the head of the family. But the only reason this got out the way it did is because the, the family failed to deal with it within the family. And then, of course, it spilled out into the public. And because all of the negative coverage against um, Harry and Meghan were never, they were, you know, the family never went on record, the palace never went on record to reject it, to say that is wrong. Harry and Meghan now feel they have no choice. To each of you, I'm wondering what, what you think needs to happen now, both in terms of the royal family and, and this couple, because surely this interview does not just sit there. No, I don't think it will. I, I, I you know, this, this is, this is huge. It, it can't just be dismissed, and it won't be dismissed. So, I think there are issues that need to be very carefully looked at. Um, I think the family ties are probably very, very, very badly damaged. Mm -hmm. I'm sure those will be healed anytime soon. Um, but I think there needs to be, you know, a, a, just a, a more measured approach to all of this. It, it feels like the narrative has become extremely heated and, and divisive. It's very sad. Roya, thank you. And, and Shola, one last thought to you. Is it possible for them to heal the rift? Of course. I mean, what they're going through is not unique to them. Many families have this. It's not beyond repair. But the point is, Buckingham Palace better take this seriously. 
not come out with any stiff upper lip nonsense. Nobody's going to stand for it. Not for the racist comment, not for their, for their lack of support for Megan's mental health, the suicidal thoughts, not the fact that, you know, um, Charles, Prince Charles, apparently failed to, to, con to even speak to his son. Why? All of those things should be answered, and they should be answered humanely, like the royal family is in touch with what the public expects from it. Shola Moser Shogbamamu and Roya Nika, thank you both for your time. We appreciate it. Thank you. Okay, next, as the murder trial in George Floyd's killing is set to begin, his family's lawyer speaks to CBC News. I would say this case is uh, probably one of the most important civil rights cases in the last 100 years. Why, he's convinced it will end in conviction. Protesters outside the courthouse in Minneapolis today as the trial of the white police officer who kneeled on George Floyd's neck was delayed. When Floyd was killed last spring, it set off a global reckoning around systemic racism. This trial is seen by many as a test of how far the United States has come. And it's certainly seen that way by Ben Crump, who represents the Floyd family, as well as the families of many other black Americans killed by police. Our senior correspondent, Susan Ormiston, spoke to Crump about his campaign for justice. Eight minutes and 46 seconds, George Floyd begged for air. With Floyd's son, Quincy, attorney Benjamin Crump takes on yet another police brutality justice case for, for black families. Justice for George Floyd. Yeah. Justice for Ahmaud Aubrey. Yeah. Yeah. He's won high-profile civil cases for Michael Brown's family in Ferguson, Breonna Taylor's in Louisville, and others. Fair away, fair away. For the Floyd family, he's suing the city of Minneapolis and the four police officers for wrongful death. As the state prosecutes the criminal murder case in Minneapolis, we reached out to Crump. But tell me, what do you see are the biggest challenges for Minnesota's prosecutors in this case? Well, historically in America, uh, the police have not been held accountable for killing African Americans. So the George Floyd case will be a referendum on how far America has come in this quest for equal justice under the law. What confidence do you have that whatever obstacles there are in that courtroom will be overcome in this case? I am cautiously optimistic that this police officer, based on this ocular proof, this irrefutable evidence, that he kept his knee on George Floyd's neck while he begged for his life 28 times, he said, I can't breathe. And so I am of the opinion that he will be convicted. Ocular proof, you mean the video? Exactly. I think once you see that video, you cannot unsee that video. And that's why people have been galvanized in cities all across America, in fact, in cities all across the globe. How would you describe to Canadians the import of this trial that we're all about to witness in Minneapolis? I would say this case is uh, probably one of the most important civil rights cases in the last 100 years. It is uh, the Emmett Till of our day. Attorney Crump, um, your clients are the Floyd family. How are they feeling today, this they, week, on the eve of this trial? Very, very anxious. Uh, and so I think like most people in America, they are anxious for justice. And so they are trying to remain positive that justice will be done. What does justice look like for them? What is it? A conviction, and not just a conviction, but a conviction to the fullest extent of the law. And if there isn't a conviction? If the police officers are not convicted for killing George Floyd, then it would be one of the worst miscarriages of justice 
in the history of America. Attorney Crump, thank you so much for your time. Thank you, uh, and please keep the family in your prayers. So, Susan, how much pressure is Ben Crump under, would you say? Well, you know, he told us he feels like he's constantly running out of time. Since Floyd's death 10 months ago, he says there have been 130 other black Americans who've died in altercations with police and more of them injured, like Jacob Blake in Kenosha, Wisconsin. Crump is also in, involved with that case. Now, he is not directly involved in the criminal trial here. That's the state against Derek Chauvin. But he'll be here. You'll be hearing a lot from him. His team is very adept at accessing the media and pressing his points. As, and as the Floyd's family lawyer and really their unofficial spokesperson, we expect to hear from him. And of course, what happens here in the criminal trial will impact the Floyd family's civil suit against the city and these police officers. Mm, okay, Susan Ormiston in Minneapolis. Thank you. We have a lot more ahead tonight, including tonight's moment. But first, planning for another summer in a pandemic, the race to book something a little closer to home. Welcome back. So have you started making summer plans? Serious question, because campsite reservations opened up online in B.C. today and eager beavers or perhaps just people desperate for a pandemic safe vacation overwhelmed the system. As Briar Stewart tells us, it looks like lots of Canadians will be staying close to home this year. It's more than three months before the start of summer, but for some, camping has become a year-round experience. Robbie Boyle bought this trailer in part because of COVID. We're not going to spend 12 grand on a cruise, right? Might as well spend 12 grand on a trailer. BC's Golden Ears Provincial Park has nearly 500 campsites. While the summer was fully booked, even the rainy, colder months have been busy. The traffic levels in January were far exceeded anything we've ever experienced before. We Reservations for the summer season open today, but calls have also been coming in for spring break. We expect it to be uh, exceptionally busy. Um, we expect to fill uh, at least one of the campgrounds during spring break, well over 180 parties. Across the country, campgrounds and parks are preparing for another season of unprecedented demand. Cottage owners, too, are seeing a flood of bookings. We're actually fully booked from end of May through to mid-September right now. Uh, we have a wait list um, and we did have some bookings now, but they got canceled um, with the lockdown due to COVID. The pandemic has made the great outdoors the destination, but the rest of the tourism sector is struggling. We also need help in the urban centers. Destination Canada says the industry is facing a $19 billion shortfall. Canadians were terrific last year in, in supporting some of our resorts like Banff and Niagara region uh, with day trips, and that's helpful, but it doesn't make up the difference for what international visitors bring. Which is why once travel is officially allowed, Canadians will be encouraged to be domestic tourists. That's the first thing I'll do. A bucket list item to drive across Canada. Boyle won't need to stay in any hotels, but he will certainly check out the sites along the way. Briar Stewart, CBC News, Maple Ridge, BC. And when we come back, tracking down a discontinued breakfast food. Why waffles meant the world to one BC boy and his mom. Our moment is next. Jericho Roman has autism, and for him, it comes with a lot of challenges around food. And these particular waffles are one of the few things he's comfortable eating, especially after suffering through a suspected COVID-19 infection earlier this year. So when they were discontinued, his mom went on a mission and received some exceptional kindness from the company that makes them. Their story is our moment tonight. The only thing really he accepted was waffles. These uh, nature's path, maple cinnamon waffles. They're completely discontinued. So I tried some other waffles to kind of slip them in and see if they were okay. But I, it was like I was giving him, you know, dirt. And it's hard because parents in my position, it's lonely. 
um, Nature's Path finally heard about the story and they tried to locate the left, the remaining ones. They worked really hard, the R&D team to really, worked really hard to kind of replicate the recipe. They struggled. It's very a finicky process. Um, they were able to go around to stores and get the ingredients to the drop off. It's, it's relieving that I'm not alone. So what she means by that is that the company uh, went into the industrial kitchen and said, okay, how can we arrange this so a home cook can do it? And what other supplies does she need? And they delivered it all to her and right. said, have at it. But, you know, there's more that they need. Yeah, yeah. Well, and, and meantime, I mean, she's put the call out saying, hey, if anyone else sees these particular waffles in, you know, freezers buried at the back of a grocery store, uh, let her know because she's uh, very interested in buying them. But little things can sometimes be big things. Uh, to Jericho, oh, it means yeah. a lot. That's The National for this March 8th. Have a great night. Good night.